This video is sponsored in part by Skillshare. This pandemic has spread faster than any disease in modern history. Two times now in the past, I made videos on a new major Resident Evil release and opened them with the excited exclamation that Resident, Resident Evil 2 7 took me by surprise. surprise. On April 3rd, just a little over a year after the Resident Evil 2 remake, Capcom released its successor, the remake to the PS1 survival horror gem Resident Evil 3 Nemesis from 1999. And after a good 8 hours of taking my good time with the game's story and campaign, and a couple of extra hours futzing around with additional bonus content, I arrived at the conclusion that this game didn't surprise me at all. The thing that probably surprised me the most about RE3 Make is how closely it ended up reflecting my expectations for it. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. After the seventh entry in the series, which I found genuinely brilliant, and after RE2 Make, which I think is an impeccably crafted reimagining of the first part of what I call in my head canon the Fall of Raccoon City duology, Capcom had re-established a great deal of trust, and my expectations for Resident Evil 3 were therefore pretty damn high already. So what does that mean? Does that mean that these sky-high expectations were met, and therefore RE3 Make ended up being a genuinely well-crafted, faithful, reimagining and loving homage to the original? Or did it end up lacking the same impact that the previous remake had and therefore leaving me feeling slightly underwhelmed despite its high production quality? Well, yes to all of those questions. This game managed to be both incredibly well crafted and underwhelming at the same time. The game oozes atmosphere and shows love and appreciation for the source material and delivers tight and gripping, action-packed gameplay built directly on the strong foundations laid out by its predecessor. And yet, it can't help but end up disappointing several parts of its audience, for various different reasons. It left me feeling weirdly torn inside. Because I genuinely enjoyed the journey, start to finish, with mostly just minor nitpicks here and there, but couldn't help notice that it left me just short of fully satisfied, despite getting almost exactly what I had anticipated from it. What a weirdly convoluted and ambiguous experience. It had me pondering for several days until I realize why this all makes perfect sense. It has to do with lenses. We'll get into this. So in this video, we're going to get to the bottom of why and how Resident Evil 3, the remake, ended up being the epitome of emotional ambivalence in video game form. Now, this video is not intended to be an end-all, be-all review that slaps a supposedly objective X out of 10 rating on the package and calls it a day. What I'm seeking with this video is discussion and reflection. I've been evaluating my own perception and experience, and especially my inner ambiguity with this game as analytically as I could, while trying to listen to a multitude of varied opinions on the game, trying to take both lovers and detractors of Resident Evil 3 into account fairly. So, where my opinion on other games is usually infallible and not to be questioned, <laughs> in this case I'm making an exception and decidedly ask you to share why and what you loved or disliked about the game in the comments section. I'm actually eager to see how far this branches. Now a little spoiler heads up, I structured this video in a way that the further you get into it, the more spoiler heavy it gets. Obviously, if you want to play Resident Evil 3, the remake, with a completely unbiased mindset, without having anything taken away from you, I'd recommend that you don't watch this video beforehand, but then again, why would you have clicked a video essay on Resident Evil 3 in the first place? Generally, I'd consider this video low to medium on spoilers, meaning that I will show footage from all parts of the game over time, but it won't go into becoming a full-blown story dissection either. So ye be warned, proceed at your own discretion. But before we continue, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives and curious people looking to broaden their horizons with thousands of classes on topics like video editing, audio recording, graphic design, game development, writing, and a lot more. I checked out the class Creative Video Storytelling and Editing, making the most of stock footage by Nikki Stevens, which goes into a plethora of great practices for efficient use of stock footage in video production, and which I'm going to recommend to anyone looking to up their video essay game from now on. Really good stuff. Another case that worked really well for me when trying out Skillshare 
So in my university days I did 3D modeling, and I've always been meaning to get back into it, but never really found the right tutorial or environment to commit to it. But then I tried it again with Skillshare, and I was surprised how quickly it clicked for me, because it was easy to find classes that suited my specific set of knowledge and expectations, fit my schedule, and that got me up to speed a lot faster than I had anticipated. I've provided a link in the description. The first thousand people to follow it will get a two-month free trial of premium membership, and after the trial period, Skillshare Premium costs under $10 a month if built annually. We've gotta be dreaming. The moment I saw the announcement by Capcom for a Resident Evil 3 remake, I felt a little bad for the developers, because this game was bound to fall between at least three chairs. On the surface level, and taken just on its own merits, this is a technically impressive, artistically consistent, tightly paced survival horror game with a stronger focus towards action than its predecessors. Pretty much how you could describe Resident Evil 3 Nemesis when it came out on the PS1 in 1999. Its roughly 6-9 to nine hour long single player campaign takes the protagonist Jill Valentine, survivor of the Spencer Mansion incident from the first Resident Evil, on a breakneck cat and mouse chase from the genetically engineered superhuman bioweapon known as Nemesis through the streets and institutions of Raccoon City during the height of the T-Virus zombie apocalypse. As I said, I've personally had a great time playing it, start to finish, with only minor nitpicks to bicker about and they were so negligible that it didn't sour my overall great experience in the slightest. But the original Resident Evil 1 was a suspense-centered, slow-paced homage to the Romero zombie era, the second turned the formula into a loving nod towards 90s action horror films, Resident Evil 3 was the continuation of that trend towards a faster, breakneck pace and more over-the-top action, but spiced things up with an antagonist whose uncanny obsession with chasing and destroying Jill and the stars almost turned it into a psychological thriller about survivor's guilt. But as you can see from this brief synopsis alone, it becomes immediately apparent that this game strongly builds on the foundations of the previous entries in the series. Narratively, this is true for both the original and the remake, but in this case I believe that more than any other game in the series, the RE3 remake's strength are based on the merits of its predecessor, um, RE2 make. Resident Evil 3 2020 came out just a little more than a year after the last game, and in many ways it feels more like a story extension based on Resident Evil 2 than an independent title on its own, or than a game exclusively meant to remake the original Resident Evil 3. Technically, this game is not just made from the same engine, but in many ways employs the same assets, reuses the exact same interface, delivers near-identical controls, enemy models and behaviors, weapons, you name it. The fact that to a considerable fraction of players Resident Evil 3 felt disappointing is in part a testament to how high the remake of Resident Evil 2 had set the bar. And I believe if this game would have been released without RE2 make beforehand, but completely on its own, in the same quality, it would have made far more of an impact. The way I see it, Resident Evil 2 2019 is what I consider the first entry in a new sub-series of Resident Evil games. In this chronology, the most recent remastered version of Resident Evil 1 is its own thing, and albeit narratively connected, the remake of Resident Evil 2 is the first entry in a new gameplay anthology. In RE2 Make, you start out as a rookie cop and a civilian, both with very little experience, especially when it comes to dealing with the specific intricacies of the T-Virus epidemic. This entire game is built around honing initially inexperienced players into peak fighting machines. I've made an entire video about how this game's story and gameplay progression, from the way the A and B routes complement the player's progression, up to the later unlocked special ops modes and even down to its achievement system, is entirely built around continuously drilling the player's skill set towards that of a, well, a zombie apocalypse experienced battle-hardened special forces operative. Quite literally even. And when I played the first hour of the Resident Evil 3 remake, it felt like this game was designed specifically with this in mind. My thesis is that Capcom made a conscious decision for the development of RE3 remake at some point when it comes to designing for a specific target audience. And that ended up being primarily players who had played and familiarized themselves with the ins and outs of the Resident Evil 2 remake. 
narratively, this fits like a glove, because in Resident Evil 3 you do assume the role of exactly what RE2 bootcamped you into. A special forces operative, experienced in the ins and outs of the T-virus epidemic. That's Jill, a member of the STARS and one of the survivors of the Spencer Mansion incident from the first game, set before the events of RE2. And this is one of the main reasons why this game, to me, feels more like a massive story DLC, or an immediate sequel far more than it feels like a remake of the original RE3 on its own merits. Not just story, but especially game design and progression-wise. When I compare how I handled myself during the first hours of Resident Evil 2, careful, meticulous, observant and slow, and still regularly startled by the surprises the game had in store for me, in the first hour of Resident Evil 3, I fought my way through the urban canyons around Moon's Donut with speed and confidence, employing the same strategies to explore my surroundings and fulfill my objectives. Like, I already started out intimately familiar with those zombies and knew that blasting them with my 9mm would only waste the sparse ammo. Especially the Spec Ops mode from RE2 had ingrained in me that, for instance, a quick headshot to topple them and a hardy sprint behind their backs would have me rush past them in seconds without wasting nearly any supplies. I know this, and I expect Jill to know this. Her character is capable in this, and having her, who's been through quite some shit just a short while ago in the Spencer Mansion incident, stumble around like a bloody amateur, like I did in the beginning of RE2 make, it would have felt ludo... ludo narratively dissonant. <laughs> Has he always been like this? But by entering the game with the experience of playing RE2 make, it was wonderfully ludonarratively resonant. See, although the original Resident Evil started out as a slow-paced, methodical survival horror game, the foreboding halls of Spencer Mansion, with a core gameplay that emphasized player disempowerment, the series was always focused on giving players an eventual power fantasy, gradually overcoming the initial weaknesses and emerging victorious against sheer impossible odds. That was already the case for the very first game in and of itself, and it's also one of the biggest aspects that I praised about Resident Evil 7. You play the first half of the game as an inexperienced, untrained, average Joe, or Ethan, tossed against completely overwhelming forces, but after standing your ground and gradually getting better and better, it character swaps you into the role of someone who actually is trained and experienced and knows the way around the very specific threat you've been fighting against for the past hours. And the shoe fits. I love this twist, and in a way, the remakes to Resident Evil 2 and 3 are doing the same thing, just spanned across two games that closely belong together as a whole. Once this realization started to sink in, a lot of the choices of the developers, and even many of the changes made to the original Resident Evil 3 started to make a lot of sense. We're going to talk a bit more about cut content later, but the most immediate and obvious change is the opening. The original Resident Evil 3 Nemesis begins with an introductory area that feels much slower and gives new players time and space to familiarize themselves with the controls, enemies, game feel, etc. before the game confronts players with Jill's Nemesis for the first time and gives them the active choice to either fight or flight. This makes sense for a game that's tailored to either complete newcomers or already battle-hardened veterans from the previous games. In the Resident Evil 3 remake, though, there is no slow build-up to acclimatize players. Here, we literally wake up in Jill's apartment, experience a short nightmare from her point of view, and then... Let me grab my... Seemingly out of nowhere, he literally bursts straight through the wall, and their hot pursuit starts less than three minutes into the game, with Jill barely escaping a burning building with her life. The game takes the ponderous opening away, and seeing it through the lens that this game is designed as a direct continuation of the journey of RE2 make, this choice makes a lot of sense. It dominates a fast and relentless pace and thereby imprints this mentality directly onto the player. The game immediately had me back in action and made use of my honed, but for several months of absence, slightly rusty skill set, just like Jill. And the fact that this worked so well for me, right out of the box, actually had me thinking about how people that had played neither the previous game nor the original Resident Evil 3 would experience this opening, and by extension how they would perceive the rest of the game. 
My intuition tells me that players who approach this game without any prior knowledge will probably have a confusing and uninviting time with his first one or two hours. Narratively, they're being tossed straight into the apex of a zombie apocalypse story arc that was built up by several games before that, but without having a big recap of what and why anything here is really happening. While the characters, including the protagonist, clearly know much more, but don't offer a lot of exposition for the players to get it. Gameplay-wise, they're equally tossed right into an intense chase sequence with the so far most fearsome of all the bioengineered enemies the previous games had thrown at the players before. And then with that constant high-level menace at their trails, they're being tossed into an even tighter, far meaner version of the zombie-infested Raccoon City semi-open world than the previous game. As a RE2 make veteran, it felt like picking up where I left off, and it felt rewarding, like putting on an old suit that still fits and looks good. But for someone new to this whole kerfuffle, I couldn't help but feel this might be a fist in the face. Where RE2 make, as well as the original RE2 and RE3, all took their time to step by step teach and acclimatize players to what each game is going to expect of them, RE3 make basically unleashes everything, or at least a great deal of what it expects you to be familiar with at once. Like, you do get the standard tutorials a la press this button to open a door or whatnot, but aside from basic controls, both RE2 make and RE3 make have many different systems that create interesting challenges when combined in different ways. And where RE2 make carefully introduces the player to the ins and outs of each system over time, and then gradually amps up the challenge by tossing new variables into the pot, RE3 pours the whole stew over your head without an entree. And for new players, I believe this might be quite a bit to swallow. Now let me be clear here. I really don't think that RE3 Remake is a particularly difficult game in and of itself. What I'm talking about is a surprisingly steep entry curve, having new players basically hit the ground running. Now, I also want to stress that this is mostly conjecture. I made these assumptions based on personal observation and an attempt to empathize with players that lack the knowledge and familiarity that I brought to the game. So I might be wrong, and it might be that players who do play this game without any prior knowledge of either RE2 make or any game of the original trilogy end up having a far better experience than I imagine. That's why if you actually are one of those people who has only played Resident Evil 3, I'd love to hear how you perceive the game's pacing and exposition, and especially the opening. Did my analysis reflect your experience, or was I completely off about it? Please let me know in the comments. Until then, my personal conclusion is that if you have neither played the RE2 make, nor the first Resident Evil before, but you're thinking of playing it, I strongly encourage you to at least start out with RE2 make before you pick this one up. Ideally though, and I mildly envy you for having the privilege to do this for the first time with a fresh mind, you should play the remastered version of the original Resident Evil first and play as Jill. This approach will give you the best narrative preparation to grasp exactly what you're supposed to understand of the story, it will make you pick up on many of the loving nods and references towards previous games, both original and remake, it will hone your skills and familiarity with the specific type of RE engine powered gameplay of the Resident Evil 2 remake, and on top of that you get to play two of the finest survival horror games ever made in direct succession. Yeah, I, I do envy you. Now the third main target group of this game are fans of specifically the third original game. People for whom Resident Evil 3 Nemesis 1999 is the personal highlight of the original trilogy. And this is, in my opinion, the target group for whom the remake will yield the most polarizing experience. I'm not sure if I would personally call it my favorite, but I find it in many ways the most fascinating game in the original series, for reasons I'll go into. On top of that, I'm genuinely terrible at what's your favorite questions, so if you'd ask me which is my favorite Resident Evil of the original trilogy, I'd probably just walk out of the room without saying a word. But when you view the remake through this lens, it becomes apparent why I was so torn on the inside while playing, why I was able to enjoy the hell out of it and at the same time feel strangely let down, like air streaming out of a balloon. Both contradictory feelings peacefully coexisting inside me without questioning each other's place. Hey. It's hard to deny, for instance, that this remake was made with a plethora of loving nods and references to the original game. Come on, you creepy ass stalker! You want stars? I'll give you stars! 
These little reaffirming bits of fan service are certainly meant to make the one or the other die-hard fan of the original smirk and feel acknowledged, but tongue-in-cheek references and easter eggs alone don't make a remake worthy of its source material. But if you regard RE3 Make from the perspective of a dedicated RE2 Remake sequel, many of the cut content choices make a lot of sense, as I mentioned earlier. The most notable examples are, as I said, the opening sequence before the Nemesis' first entrance, and then entire segments such as the cemetery and the clock tower. There are more changes that alter the general progression and feel of the story, lots of smaller ones and some bigger ones, but I also think the story as it's presented in the remake works the way it's done. Anyway, my point is that these removed sections of the original game all present relatively drastic shifts in the game's overall pacing curve. To demonstrate this, I've visualized the pacing curves of both games on a graph. And if you look at the sections removed from the original game and the remake, you'll see that they all serve as interruptions of the gradual upward pacing curve. This is by no means a bad thing, and done quite deliberately. But if we compare this to the pacing curve of the remake, you'll notice that it feels much more deliberately engineered towards a very classic ideal narrative pacing structure. An increasing sign-like curve that opens with a loud bang to grab the player's attention, followed by gradual valleys, because a constant high feels exhausting and daunting, regularly leading to intensity peaks that culminate the previous phase. There's this famous graph of the original Star Wars pacing curve that's often used as a teaching example for how to perfectly pace a story's suspense and release progression. And Resident Evil 3 feels almost bioengineered, pun intended, to match this narrative best practice. And if we consider what they were going for, the breakneck continuation of RE2 make with the player already starting at a high point of intensity, and RE3 makes progression tailored towards embracing the more driven, action-focused side of the original Resident Evil 3, these choices make a lot of sense. But there's also the case to be made that video games simply are not movies. The audience in a game is not passive, and therefore the best practice for a film is by no means the best practice for a video game. I personally felt that quite a bit, that the progression of RE3 Make often felt too predictably perfectly crafted. Because I was rarely surprised when the game all of a sudden increased the tension and tossed me into another one of its more intense moments, most of which were based around the recurring and ever more intense encounters with the Nemesis. And here I must say that because his persistence and his appearance became more and more predictable, and because I was already quite well trained to deal with a similar type of juggernaut enemy from the previous game, namely Mr. X, Nemesis rarely felt like a real challenge nor a startling surprise, and increasingly became something of an annoyance to me towards the end. And that is, despite the fact that I found some of the boss encounters with him to be thoroughly enjoyable, and they even managed to get my blood pumping at times, as you can clearly see from my shaky mouse hand. <laughs> yep, this is me playing intense 3D games with keyboard and mouse. Sincere apologies to anyone with a tendency to motion sickness. Now, does that mean that the original Resident Evil 3 would be better without these segments as well? No, not in the slightest. And the reason for that is that the original game, despite also being a more action-oriented approach than its two predecessors, aims for a different core emotional experience for the players. And that experience is centered far more around agency. One of the central aspects that Resident Evil 3 revolves around is its protagonist, Jill. And for the point I'm trying to make, she serves as a wonderful microcosm of what can potentially make a die-hard Resident Evil 3 fan's experience with the remake, despite being an excellently crafted game, something of a letdown. Where am I? What's going on? Now, overall, the way the new Jill was designed, portrayed, and acted in the remake, it generally received very positive feedback. The remake's version of the classic Star Supercom is a new interpretation of the character, but it is much closer to the original Jill than, for instance, the rebooted Lara Croft is to her original interpretation. I personally really enjoy the new Jill, and I think as a character on her own merits, there's very little wrong with her. In line with the overall tone of this duology of remakes, her looks and appearance, and also the way she's designed and rendered, aims for a more believable feel. 
Her voice and motion capture acting feels authentic and convincing, and overall she feels like a believable, even relatable person. It really didn't take long for her to grow on me, and I think this mirrors the overall response of the larger audience. But yet, a part of the fandom couldn't really get warm with the new Jill. And I'm not going to argue against this because I get them. Because it once again depends on which lens you apply to approach the game with. If you view this game through the lens of it is the direct sequel to Resident Evil 2 Remake, I don't think you're going to find a lot wrong with the remake, Jill. The problems only come up if you judge it on the foundation of solely the original Resident Evil 3. Because this game, although it was already more action-focused and high-octane than its two prequels, gave the players several instances of direct gameplay choices. In the opening segment of the game, for instance, you could decide to stay and fight the nemesis early on, or flee and save your resources. I often hear that it doesn't affect the later gameplay, which is technically true, but it does affect the player's internal perception of Jill's character. Both choices are valid, but each choice adds a different element to the characterization of Jill Valentine. It's a bit like the famous The Walking Dead moment that Telltale's quote-unquote non-choices often get criticized for. Save either Carly or Doug from the zombie death and the game will leave the branching path back together by killing off the one that you saved an episode later. It's been regularly criticized as a microcosm for choices that effectively don't matter. But they do matter. They change how you, the player, roleplay the character you're in control of. And the original Resident Evil 3 gave the players far more agency over how they roleplayed Jill. Did she make it through the Spencer Mansion incident, emerging as a battle-hardened fighting machine? Or is she scarred and plagued by survivor's guilt? I believe that this is where a lot of the discrepancy with the new Jill stems from. The remake takes a big part of this agency away from the players and decides on one interpretation, an absolutely valid one by the way, and commits to it. Which, yeah, it's a choice that I can understand and respect. The remakes in general, through their more acted out direction and photorealistic rendition of the setting, simply makes interpretation, well, not impossible, but definitely harder than in the originals, where the models and animations overall only conveyed a fraction of the expressiveness of the state-of-the-art motion and facial captured acting performances of the new games. And that's not a criticism of either version of the game, it's just different. Which is why I'm personally very okay with this Jill, who is somewhere in between those two contrasting interpretations I gave earlier, with a slight penchant towards the battle-hardened, but relatable 90s action movie heroine. I don't mind a little detective work. Alright, where does that leave us? The bottom line for me is pretty much what it says on the tin. Resident Evil 3 is an excellently crafted game that works best if you consider it a direct sequel or alternatively a full price single player DLC continuation of the fall of Raccoon City. But it can at the same time leave you a little bit disappointed if you consider yourself a diehard fan of the original and expect it to be a congruent one-on-one -on -one refurbishment of it, especially when it comes to some of the underlying themes. Resident Evil 3 is a remake that stands in service of the original's work it's built on because it delivers a new, but at the same time faithful and loving interpretation of it while not trying to render the original obsolete. Quite the opposite, I am excited about the fact that the sprawling success of this remake will have exposed many new players to the masterpiece that is Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. And that's what a good remake should do in my opinion. Aside from making Capcom lots and lots of money, which, well, according to their press releases, it sure did. And technically, if you think about it though, this remake is actually closer to the original vision of Resident Evil 3 than even the original PS1 game itself, because that one was initially meant to be a mission pack for Resident Evil 2. Just saying. Now, as I said, Capcom has really managed to re-establish some of the trust in what they're doing in recent years. Both the Resident Evil and Devil May Cry IPs have been blessed with tremendously good new entries, and this makes me excited for, I feel almost guilty for saying it, more remakes. Because man, speculating about which classic in Capcom's lineup could be remade next really fills me with excitement for once. There are so many great titles that have the potential to become absolutely stellar games in their own right if they get the same high quality treatment as Resident Evil 2 and 3. Because I mean, 
I think it's rather unlikely that Capcom will go straight to Resident Evil 4. Uh, oh. Oh, well. I mean... Okay, I mean, this could be great. Resident Evil 4 is a phenomenal game, and not even that old, but seriously. Even this could work tremendously well when approached from that angle of continuing the progression that I talked about earlier. RE2 make drills players from rookie to special forces, RE3 make throws you right back into the fray as said experienced special forces soldier, garnering even more experience in the process, and in Resident Evil 4 you return as the previous rookie who is now a super secret highly trained special agent himself. But this time you start the game already familiar with the intricacies of a third person RE engine game in Spain. Might not be a perfect pitch, but hey. They could also just leave everything as is, bring the graphics up to speed, and just remove the darn quick time events. That would already be enough. Hey, but seriously, the fact that they're working on a guaranteed cash cow Resident Evil 4 remake doesn't mean that it can't and won't remake other games as well, right? Personally, my biggest hopes are on... Dino Crisis. Now if you ask me, this is the duology that would really benefit from the RE engine treatment. The originals were some of the most adrenaline-inducing survival horror games I've ever played, and they pulled that off without flashy graphics, but mainly by making the game spine-crushingly difficult. I honestly think if Dino Crisis got a remaster that used the full technical capabilities of the RE engine, with its impressive rendering capabilities and the stunning physicality of objects and bodies, paired with some of the most visually jaw-dropping dinosaur adversaries, and worked on getting that same sense of pulse-pounding survival horror dread across once more... <whistles> and hey, this is not that unlikely. Because end of November last year, Capcom silently registered a new trademark for... Dino Crisis. No official announcements than that, but one can hope. Right? One can hope. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. Before you leave, I'd like to give you an update on where my channel currently stands and share some of its economic realities, because I want to be open and transparent about this with you guys. And on top of that, I also have an exciting announcement to make. So, you'll have noticed that this video had a sponsor, which is a first for this channel. Now, if you've known me for a while, you're aware that I was never a fan of sponsorships, but equally, I'm also very much not a fan of YouTube ads. I've been wanting to get rid of them for years, but they've sadly been an economic necessity for the sustenance of my channel as well. Niche content, low to medium volume channels like mine, with a low frequency but high quality video output, with videos sometimes taking up to several months to produce start to finish, simply don't even remotely reach the regions where YouTube's ad revenue will generate enough to even be able to pay for monthly expenses. For the past four or so years, the lion's share of my channel's income has been covered by crowdfunding, monthly donations from you, the audience, via Patreon. And I've been working tirelessly toward a point where my monthly income would allow me to cover all my expenses and comfortably start regularly working with additional talent, so I can create more content without sacrificing quality, writing and production. I have always many more topics that I'd love to cover than I have time to create as a one-person operation. But it's been a Sisyphus task for a long time. With my channel's reach and output, it's been hovering around the break-even point for years without ever breaking through that ceiling. Now, I've been very lucky to have found a sponsor for this video that didn't feel like I was sacrificing my principles, since I had been using this service myself and still am. This partnership is a one-time deal and an experiment for me, but fact is that it immediately and generously covered enough that it comfortably allowed me to work with and decently pay additional talent for future projects and also cover all my expenses for once. Plus, I do prefer having the choice who advertise on my videos, which is not the case for automated YouTube ads. I'm making these videos because I love making them, and I've never been aiming at hoarding wealth with this. That's a bad business concept in the first place, if you ask me. So with this month, for the first time since I started this channel, mildly exceeding my projected cap, I've decided to celebrate this with you guys with another endeavor I've been really aching to do for a long, long time, and that is hosting a charity stream. This Sunday, April 26th, I'm going to revisit Resident Evil 7, stream it start to finish, and we'll be collecting donations for MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders. During the COVID-19 crisis, MSF is working tirelessly to provide and maintain healthcare, protect vulnerable and the most at-risk people, as well as healthcare workers in places across the globe with more fragile health systems that have a limited or no basic safety net. 
I am going to kindle the stream's donation counter with a pledge based on the excess of this video's sponsorship revenue, and our goal will be to see if we can double it. A link to my Twitch channel and the exact time of the stream you can find in the description, and I hope you'll be there. Now, lastly, if you'd like to help me to reach my monthly crowdfunding goal here for the channel and support it, here's the link to my Patreon. Thank you so much for considering, and my sincere gratitude to anyone who has been supporting me there over the past years. A special shout out goes out to my top tier supporters Ronan Krom, Chris Z, Kenan Ward, aka Legolas Katarn, Laird Wakala, Chuck Taylor, Gehenas, Pablo Arcelas, Malim, Nathan O'Connor, Sven Bischoff, Joey Monster, Christine, Evan Tekre, Terry Collins, Andrew Hines, Matt Gratton, Dimitar Slatko, Adriel Garcia, Lawrence E. Buben, Max Macula, Billy Lott, Swallowtail Knights, Wobbles and Bean the Wonder Ducks, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Agustin Ortega, Alan Wilder, Casper Rahm, Thwagam, Quentin Podom, Jordan, Faulty Gear, Kevin H. Yang, Nobad Gerard Matinka, Chris Chan, Ty McCandless, Jin Hansen, Mura Casardes, and Sophie Paulson. Until next time, ta-ta!